Thank you so much. It's really a joy to be here. I understand these sessions are also uh, being recorded, so um, uh, they'll be available for your use and that of others uh, as time goes on. I really want to make this day uh, not only informative but inspiring for you. We call Priests for Life a ministry of encouragement. It's not that we don't know the church's teachings on abortion. It's not that we don't already care deeply about the pro-life cause, but it's that we need each other. We need the encouragement not only to persevere, but to give this the, the, the measure of devotion, the measure of passion, the measure of urgency necessary for victory. Because unlike a, a lot of other dimensions of, of um, the things that we, we believe, this is an immediate life and death struggle. As John Paul II said at the World Youth Day in Denver in 1993, when he preached at the uh, Mass on the Feast of the Assumption and talked about the battle for life, together with the assertion, which is really at the heart of our own approach to this problem, the assertion that the outcome of the battle for life has already been decided because Christ is risen, the kingdom of death is conquered, Nevertheless, he also said to that same crowd, Woe to you if you do not succeed in defending life. Because if we don't, everything else is lost. We have not not simply a a, a battle here in which either pro-life wins or pro-choice wins. The fact of the matter is if pro-life doesn't win, nobody wins. There is no victory in death. You know, one of the mistakes that the other side makes is that they confuse the promise. They confuse the choice. God says in Deuteronomy, well, I set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life. Notice what the choice is. Life and blessings on the one side, death and curses on the other. The mistake that the other side makes is not to to, uh, assert that there's a choice. Of course there's a choice. The mistake they make is to confuse the terms of the choice because they think the choice is death and blessings versus life and curses. It isn't. It's life and blessings versus death and curses. You can't choose death without dying yourself. You can't win when the choice that you have won is death. And, 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 and so you and I, in our role specifically as priests, will be exercising within the church, and we'll explore here today what that, what that specific role is. How do we fight abortion as a priest? But in doing so... We are leading the church to victory in an arena in which what is at stake is the very survival of our human family, the very fabric of civilization. One of the things that brings this to light most powerfully is in Evangelium Vitae, when the Holy Father begins talking about uh, civil law and the state and what happens when a state authorizes the destruction of the innocent. In section 20 of the encyclical, he says, when this happens, that abortion and euthanasia are made legal, you have a tyrant state. And the disintegration of the state itself has begun. That's powerful language. He's not saying simply that it's a bad legislative decision or a mistaken court uh, decision. Uh, there are certainly many bad legislative decisions and mistaken policies that you know, get passed by legitimate authority, are recognized as legitimate, but then have to be changed, or perhaps completely repealed. But in this case, there are two differences. Number one, it's not simply a bad decision. It the, it's changes the nature of the state. The very foundation of the state erodes. The collapse of the state has begun because, as he says in more detail in that particular section of Evangelium Vitae, there there is a mere 
a caricature of democracy, but, but re- really the community has no longer become the place where everyone has an equal uh, uh, entitlement to, uh, to protection. But the other uh, d- uh, uh, difference is that it's not a legitimate decision in the first place. In other words, that when a particular uh, government authorizes the killing of the innocent, that decision is not that valid, is not to be recognized as valid. It's not a law. It doesn't have a claim on our conscience. It's completely empty. So that in our case in the United States, Roe v. Wade is not a valid judicial decision. So we don't recognize, not, it's not like we recognize its authority, but we say it's wrong. The church's approach is deeper than that. We don't recognize its authority to begin with. So we're talking about something which goes to the very core of our existence as a nation and our existence in the world as a family of nations. And at the same time, which we'll also explore today during our time together, it goes to the very core of the faith. So both on a natural and a supernatural level, we're talking about something that's right at the heart, right at the core, right at the foundation of what we are doing uh, as a society and as a church. The very nature of the faith. And we'll explore a lot of dimensions today where we can see that addressing abortion, addressing the right to life, explaining to people and inviting people to take part in what the pro-life movement is, is not something that we add on top of our faith or our ministry. Uh, and, And this is a fundamental concept for us to to embrace. It's that when we talk about pro-life, are we talking about an extracurricular activity, so to speak? Is this something that we add on top of the core, ordinary calling of our day-to-day ministry as priests in the church? Or, on the other hand, is this something that is right at the heart of that ministry and, in fact, flows from it necessarily? Well, we'll look at that. You know, I was uh, praying in front of an abortion facility one time. I think it was out in uh, Idaho. And, and uh, it was a group of about 20 of us. And, and one of the, the gentlemen with us who was praying inadvertently had placed his toes over the property line of the clinic. Well, would you believe they noticed that? And somebody came out yelling at us, get your feet off our property. So I was leading the prayers at that point, and I paused and I looked at them and I said, and when are you going to get your hands off God's property? This is not only a matter of defending the right to life of the child, This is a matter of defending the rights of the Creator. If, in fact, they who say abortion is a right are right, then God is not God. To whom do we belong? The question at stake here when we begin to explore what the relationship is between the abortion problem and the ministry of proclaiming the gospel is that the question isn't simply, when does life begin? That is a biological question that has already been settled. But the issue doesn't revolve simply around that question. It's a crucial question. It's also a question we can know the answer to, and that we have to teach the answer to. But what we're wrestling with is a problem far deeper than that. Really, the battle that we're engaged in here is the question, who are we? And whose are we? That's the question of the pro-life battle. That's what we stand up to proclaim to society. Who are we? Whose are we? When somebody says, this is just a mass of cells, a clump of tissue... If they're right, they've also said that about all of us. 
You can't be right about that just in regard to one segment of humanity. If that child is just a mass of cells, then so are you. And that's the point. To help people to understand that the destiny of this child and the destiny of all of us, the dignity of this child and the dignity of the rest of us are inextricably linked. One cannot be separated from the other, nor can the dignity or the rights or the concern and love we have for that child be separated from the dignity, rights, and the concern and love we have for the mother and the father of that child. And we'll explore a little bit of that today, too. How we do not say in the pro-life movement that we love the baby and forget about the mother. What we say is, let's love them both. And there are so many ways in the practice of our ministry that we also can make that clear to our people in very, very practical ways. So these are some of the things I want to explore, and I want to leave um, adequate time so that we can deal with questions that are on your mind, either that might be prompted by something I say, or that might, you might already have in your mind. One of the things I would uh, want to see happen as a result of our time together today is that if there is some unresolved issue, not only in your mind, but maybe in your heart, maybe it's a question of, you know, how, much do I, how far do I really need to go? How far should I go on this particular uh, matter? How do I, you know, ultimately it's a question of integration. How do I integrate this or that aspect of my life or ministry into the wider battle for life? My hope would be that today you'd get some resolution that maybe you haven't gotten before or, or, that, or, that, or that persistent questions in your mind that arise when the question of abortion is dealt with can come out into the open that we can wrestle with those things together and, and really uh, have you leave at the end of the day really feeling empowered all the more uh, to address these, these concerns. So I want to leave adequate time uh, to, do, to do precisely that. Uh, and I'll also, uh, uh, during the course of the day, refer you to a lot of different resources. Because any time that there is a conference like this on whatever topic it is, really what the speaker, all the speaker can do besides sharing a, a, a few thoughts as time permits and answering some questions is to give you arrows pointing you to resources that you can use throughout the year, in fact, throughout your life. And uh, I want to... Uh, uh, have you feel at the end of the day today that you have your finger on resources that are going to help you throughout your priesthood uh, on every aspect of the pro-life uh, movement. So I'll begin uh, here showing you a, some of those resources um, uh, presently. Uh, it is also my hope that as a result of our time here together, um, that and I know many of you have been following our work already, um, but I want to really initiate today an ongoing relationship both with the seminary all right, so that we can be at your service in uh, a number of different ways when it comes to uh, the battle for, for life uh, and also with you individually in your own diocese. As I know, uh, many different dioceses are represented here today and, and we at Priests for Life, the five priests who work with me full-time uh, in this mission, as well as our wider pastoral team. Uh, altogether, we've got about 60 people uh, working full-time right now in this ministry. But our, particularly our priests and our pastoral team who go around traveling and speaking are, are in uh, your dioceses and other dioceses all the time. Uh, I, uh, I myself am privileged to travel so constantly that I get to about four states every week. And uh, so if I haven't been to your hometown or to your diocese, uh, you can pretty much count on it that I'll be there before too long. So, and it's the same with our other priests. And it's a privilege for us, therefore, to be able to establish an ongoing relationship, as I said before, a ministry of encouragement that you know that whether it's with you individually or with the parishes that you'll eventually serve or with any need that there might be that you have to address, that we're a resource for you, coming alongside of you, uh, supporting you, not only giving you the tools to deal with the pastoral issues, uh, but also giving you the personal, spiritual encouragement you need uh, because uh, we'll, be, um, we'll be opposed 
uh, in many different ways. And therefore, again, as I've already said, we need one another as we go forward in this mission. I want to start by showing you a clip by somebody who uh, passed away just recently, uh, in February to be precise, uh, Dr. Bernard Nathanson. Um, Now, as uh, most of you will know, uh, Dr. Nathanson, in his own, as he explained it in his own words, uncaged the abortion monster in the United States. This man, together with just a handful of others, started the group that is now called NARAL Pro-Choice America, but started out, and there were several name changes in between, started out as the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Laws. They set out with the goal of making abortion legal throughout the United States. And they fed false statistics to the media regarding how many women were dying from illegal abortion and how many Americans supported legal abortion and all kinds of other statistics that Dr. Nathanson, after he became pro-life, would stand in front of audiences like this. He would put his hands up and he would say, where did we get these statistics? I don't know. We invented them out of thin air. And that's literally what happened as he attests in his, in his various books, uh, abor- Aborting America being one of them and the Abortion Papers uh, being another such book. Dr. Nathanson ran the world's largest abortion clinic in New York City for a long time. And between the abortions he did with his own hands, including aborting his own child, if you can imagine that, killing your own son with your bare hands, dismembering him, and he says in his, in his third, his last book, The Hand of God, which talks about his spiritual conversion, he says, when I aborted my own child, He says, believe it or not, I felt nothing when that procedure was completed except the satisfaction, pragmatically and professionally, of having done a technically good job. No emotion. Disconnected, dehumanized, because you can't dehumanize the child without dehumanizing yourself. Dehumanized, he says, but between, between the abortions he did with his own hands and the medical students he supervised, and the abortions in the clinic that he ran, he was responsible for some 75,000 abortions. He eventually became pro-life because of the science, because of human reason, because of the absurdity of killing these children on one floor of the building where he worked, and then on the other floor, the very same children at the very same age being saved. It, It didn't fit anymore in his mental framework as it shouldn't fit in anybody's. And he began to question, and then eventually oppose the practice of abortion. He was not yet a believer. But then he started associating with people like us. He started associating with people in the church, people in the pro-life movement. And he said that eventually it was the love and care of those pro-life people that broke the shell of his atheism. It was also the fact that they were being driven, the evidence that they were being driven by some force beyond themselves that he did not understand when he saw, for example, the sacrifices people were making to save unborn children, those that would go in front of the abortion facilities and endure ridicule, and even in those days that he was going through this journey, even arrest in the peaceful blockading of the abortion facilities, he looked at all this and he said, well, something is motivating these people that I don't understand. There's, there's a spiritual force here. He was seeing the fruit of love. He was seeing what we're, we reflected on briefly in the, in the homily this morning. This is my body given for you. The dynamic that led Christ to the cross is the dynamic that leads us to sacrifice ourselves for others, including the unborn. And he, he saw that. And so he began to consider the reality of the spiritual world. I had the privilege shortly after I began doing this work full-time, I began in 1993, uh, the following year, of moderating a workshop at a Human Life International conference that took place in Irvine, California. And Dr. Nathanson was one of the speakers, and it was his workshop that I was asked to moderate. So I had the privilege to introduce him and And he got up and he said, I'm changing the topic of my talk today. It's not going to be what it was scheduled to be, namely chemical abortion. He said, I'm going to talk today 
about my spiritual journey. Now, he had been speaking about pro-life and about the medical and scientific dimensions of it and his change to a pro-life position, but he had never spoken about his spiritual journey. So we were in awe already before he even started the talk. And then he took us on a journey through his personal discovery of God among the pro-life people. Then he began to say, as his talk came to a conclusion, he began to say things we had never heard him say before, that the New Testament promise of eternal life was valid, and that he would rather be wronged with the likes of the great saints and apostles and defenders of the faith throughout the ages than to be right with the godless, destructive people in history who have stained human history with holocausts and genocide. And Then he stood before us and said, I come here to you today on the brink of conversion to the Catholic Church. That room exploded. It wasn't just a standing ovation. It was a leaping ovation. People were jumping up into the air. Because what this man was telling us right there before our eyes was the culmination of perhaps the most incredible uh, uh, journey in our modern times, from, uh, 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 from, from destructive, destructive embrace of the culture of death to being a pro-life advocate and soon a Catholic. He said at the end of his remarks, I hope God can forgive me. So in thanking him, I took the microphone and said, Dr. Nathanson, when Mother Teresa ministered to the dying in the streets of Calcutta, She would often be asked by non-believers, this Jesus that you talk about, this God that you believe in, is he like you? And she would answer, no, but I try to be like him. And I said to him, if you've experienced the kindness and love of the pro-life people, it's because we're just trying to be like God. And he has already forgiven you. And all of us began praying spontaneously for him right at that moment. It was about a year and a half later that Cardinal O'Connor of New York had the privilege of baptizing Dr. Nathanson. Recently, he died in February. I visited him a few days before his death, and he was only able to speak in a whisper. Put my ear right up against his, his, uh, near his face, and first thing he said to me was, How goes the crusade? His mind was on the pro-life people who had first inspired him to believe. And he encouraged all of them. And then I reminded him of that exchange back at that conference in 1994. Let me show you a clip about something he said about us. I am Father Frank Pavone, National Director of Priests for Life. In February of 2011, Dr. Bernard Nathanson, one of the founders of the abortion rights movement, who then later became an ardent pro-life activist and a Catholic, passed away. I was privileged to know him and to interview him. And I want to show you a clip from a 1999 interview in which he summarizes the fact, as he said on other occasions, that he and his colleagues in starting the abortion movement would not have gotten away with what they did if we, the clergy and the church, had been united, purposeful, and strong. Listen to what Dr. Nathanson says. In the late 60s, when we organized NARAL, the National Abortion Rights Action League, uh, most of our activity and our activism were predicated or premised on the fact, which we knew, that the clergy was not vigilant, was virtually sleeping, not literally, but 
figuratively sleeping on this subject, that they could not envision such a revolution, a social revolution, as uh, legalizing abortion. Now, we took great advantage of that. We made capital of that because uh, once the clergy were caught napping uh, and we moved ahead of them, then by the time the clergy, principally the Catholic clergy, woke up to the fact that we were miles ahead of them, it was Roe v. Wade time, and suddenly abortion was legal. We invite you to spread the message of Dr. Nathanson. Check our website for more details about him and his writings. And let's follow his example by working to see that the church no longer gets caught asleep about the culture of death. God bless you. Now, uh, first of all, this little clip you just saw is from a YouTube site that you may want to take note of, youtube.com slash seminarians for life. Um, it's one of a number of uh, channels that we, uh, that we operate. We have youtube.com slash seminarians for life. We also have deacons for life and, of course, priests for life. Um, and then I have um, my own channel on which I put a wide range uh, of different pro-life kinds of videos, uh, youtube.com slash fr frank pavone. The, um, uh, but on the Seminarians for Life YouTube channel, we'll be putting up a number of clips of Dr. Nathanson uh, from that interview from which I took this one. And also what we do normally on this channel is, um, is, is the following. We'll take the upcoming Sunday and the readings of the Sunday uh, liturgy, and I'll talk for just about a minute or two about how a preacher can draw out from those readings of that weekend themes of, of uh, the defense of life. Because the Scriptures are the word of life, and uh, there, there's, there's, there's a, a way, no matter what the readings are, to show the application of that to, uh, to the church's great work of proclaiming the gospel of life. So it's a practical help to preaching, and you can take advantage of it either through this YouTube channel or in the following way um, at priestsforlife.org slash liturgy. Let me just show you this practical resource um, because what we do, again, is we take the Sunday's readings and we draw out pro-life themes. We also provide uh, this, uh, not only on this particular page I'm going to now, okay, so you see liturgical resources for each Sunday. Uh, we also provide this uh, via an email that um, you can subscribe to. And before the day is over, I'm going to pass around some yellow cards so that if you want to receive regular uh, email alerts and other things from our ministry, you can do so. Uh, but the, these come uh, by email. And also we have an iPhone app that um, enables you to access these weekly liturgical resources, not only the, the homily hints, but also um, a paragraph for the parish bulletin reflecting on some aspect of the church's pro-life teachings, usually an excerpt from a document like Evangelium Vitae or a, a statement from one or another of the, uh, of the bishops or of the Holy Father. Uh, and then also general intercessions. Uh, as you may know, the pastoral plan for pro-life activities of the United States uh, bishops contains in it an exhortation that a petition for life and for a culture of life be included in every Mass. So in order to help priests fulfill that particular uh, exhortation, we have supplied an entire set of general intercessions for every Sunday of the year for all three cycles. And uh, within those petitions, of course, is, uh, is, uh, is one explicitly for life. So you see, for example, for um, uh, this, uh, this weekend, Sunday, April 10th, if you... Uh, Click on that, you'll see what I mean. We have the general intercessions followed by the bulletin insert, also in Spanish. And then 
homily suggestions. Of course, this Sunday being the fifth Sunday of Lent in cycle A, we have the raising of Lazarus. And let's see, let me give you this as an example here of what we, uh, uh, of what we, uh, of what we say here. The theme of the readings this weekend is an overwhelming proclamation that God is master of life and death. Lent is meant to deepen our awareness and conviction of this truth, which is in turn the basis of the pro-life movement. We're not simply counteracting an evil in society through human strength, but rather we're sent on a mission by the one who has authority over death to free humanity from its oppressive regime. Now, going to the story of Lazarus, imagine going to a wake service and having someone say, if you had been here sooner, my loved one would never have died. That's what Martha and Mary say to Jesus. They knew he had power over life and death. Uh, and yet they were subject to the all-too-human fears and calculations that we make when we battle the culture of death. Because Martha says, by now there will be a stench. We say the same thing. We know what's right. We know what has to be said and done to defend life. But we fear the stench. Who will object? Who will get angry? Politicians fear who will vote against them. Businesses fear who will stop supporting them. Surely there will be a stench. And that becomes the excuse not to act, even though we know Jesus has authority over death. As we approach the climax of Lent and proclaim these powerful readings of God's victory over death, let's call our people to a confident and persistent activism for the cause of life without fear or excuses. So you see, it's not the homily itself. It's guidance for the preacher on how to, and how to bring out in the homily, whether he wants to make it the whole homily or just portions of it or even just a mention along the way of the battle against the culture of death. Shows him how to do that uh, based on, on preaching on those particular readings. So I encourage you not only to use these resources uh, but make others, uh, others aware of them uh, so that we can, uh, we can continue to encourage uh, one another. Dr. Nathanson's... Um, Words there are, 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 are profound in terms of that they, he and his colleagues knew that they could get the media on their side and the government on their side and academia on their side, but they knew they couldn't get the church on their side. The best they could do is take a gamble that the church wouldn't speak up too loudly or clearly or in too united a fashion. And that was a gamble that they took and, uh, and, uh, and succeeded. He devoted the last few years of his life to becoming a bioethicist by working on the uh, upcoming bioethical issues like uh, gene and intervene isolation. Uh, lest, he said, lest we be caught asleep again. Uh, and, of course, that's one of the things that we try to do in our mission. Let me allow some time uh, for questions just... Uh, uh, after one, uh, one, one simple point that sums up what we've been saying so far. When we talk about the gospel of life, we're not talking about a different gospel. There's only one gospel, obviously, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And John Paul II in Evangelium Vitae said, the gospel of Christ is the gospel of life. It's the proclamation of the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. So that this mission flows from the very core of our faith, that God not only created human life, I mean, that's enough of a basis to defend it, but that he assumed it, that he himself took on a human nature, uniting, therefore, all human nature, including uh, those in the womb, uh, to himself, in a way, then, that shows the human family its destiny. Revelation 3.21, to the victor, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Think of it this way. You and I are sent into a world of despair to proclaim that people's destiny is to reign forever on the throne with Christ. If we proclaim that as the hope of the human family, if we proclaim that as the good news, and that's what we're ordained to do, well then, it's incomprehensible and contradictory for our people 
to hear that claim, to receive that promise, and then at the same time to turn around and ignore it when those same human beings, that same human nature, is being thrown in the garbage. It's the, the allowing of things, the tolerance of things like abortion, is a direct contradiction to the core of the gospel precisely because the gospel is about the exaltation of human dignity in Christ to reign with him forever on the throne. On the throne. And this is one of the many ways in which we can see that being ordained to preach the gospel is in fact being ordained to proclaim, celebrate, and serve the gift of life. Let's take a few questions before our first break on anything I've said so far or on anything else on your mind in regard to these issues. Oh, you've got the mic. Hi, Father. Thank you for being here today. My pleasure. I just have a question about uh, maybe some of the uh, obstacles you might run into in your ministry um, with priests. Uh, I, I know sometimes it, it's hard for anyone to go and, and pray in front of an abortion uh, clinic facility. Um, but at the same time, especially for priests to have the, uh, the courage, the fortitude to stand up and witness for life. If you could just talk about that and, and how you've addressed that. We have a booklet um, it may be in the packets that I have distributed today. Let me see one of them, uh, if I could. I think it's in here, called Addressing Abortion with Confidence. Yes. Um, now, this, this little booklet takes about 20 different um, reasons that we have found, or at least assertions that many of our priests will make about why they're hesitant or fearful in getting involved in this issue and addresses each of those concerns. Uh, and so you'll see it's, it's multifaceted, but I think in many ways it boils down to, first of all, a, um, um, a, a, a personal discomfort with, with matters of controversy, uh, or specifically with the matter of abortion in this sense. And it's, a kind of, it's the same kind of problem that much of the general public has, namely... If I, here's how it plays out in their own, their own psychological landscape. If I become too vocal or active against abortion, I'm setting myself up against those who have had abortions or who may feel they need to have them in the future. Now, maybe those people include my sister, my niece, my mother, my cousin, my friend. And we don't want to, any more than anyone else, set ourselves up as enemies of those people. In the subsequent talks I'm going to share with you today, we're going to explore that in depth. How do we overcome that fear that by setting myself up against abortion, I'm setting myself up against those who've had abortions? And of course, the short form of the answer is, we embrace them with love and we show that we embrace them with love, both before and after the abortion. And therefore, we become a movement that is known by its, by its love, not by judgmentalism. That's one of the things that, that many priests are concerned uh, about. And, and there's another whole area of concern that I also want to talk about at greater length later, and that is the fear of seeming to be too political, particularly too partisan. And, um, well, you know, in a nutshell, think of it this way. When we stand up and say that the first duty of public uh, servants is to know the difference between serving the public and killing the public, and that we have to elect pro-life candidates to office, what about that message would change if tomorrow the Democratic and Republican parties swapped their positions on abortion and all the candidates did the same thing? What about our message would change? And of course the answer is nothing. Not a sentence, not a word. So are we being partisan or nonpartisan? If I stand up and say, here's the moral truth, here's the gospel of Jesus Christ, here's the implications of that gospel for the responsibilities of voters and office holders, yes, my words are de facto going to help or hurt particular candidates and parties, but if it hurts them, it's not my fault, it's their fault for taking the position that they take. 
Our platform is not the Republican platform or the Democratic platform. Our platform is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we proclaim it no matter whether it benefits or hurts any candidate or party. But this is an issue that many priests have not been able to sort out in their mind and heart. We'll go into it in a little bit more detail later on. Father Pavone, uh, thank you for being here. This is an honor. Recently, a few of us that were here present were able to, to listen to Dr. Peter Kreeft, who came to St. Louis, and he was talking about how there's nothing holier than the Eucharist and a woman's body, and it is by no mistake or coincidence that the evil one has attacked both. And I was wondering, I noticed in one of your packets it talks about this is my body and how it's by no coincidence that you as a priest consecrating the Eucharist describe in the person of Jesus Christ that this is my body. And many today argue in favor of abortion, saying it's a woman's body, she has the right to, cho to choose. I was wondering if you could speak any more to the deep theological dimension of that that phrase and what, what you have outlined here in this packet. There, there is, a, is, the, is the, this is my body pamphlet in there uh, because that goes into some of this. Yes, this is my body. I'm going to show you, in fact, a video uh, song that has been made based on this theme. Uh, it's, it's, it's profound for us because not only of the usage of the very same four words, both to give life and to take life, which, of course, is a testimony to the fact that the devil imitates what is divine and sacred in order to try to destroy it. But also in the fact of what the Eucharist does. Uh, think about it for a moment. The Eucharist, the source and summit of the life and activity of the church, is what draws people together. The whole human family, the whole church. What does abortion do? Drives them apart. Abortion is, at its heart and core, divisive, because it's attacking the most basic relationship in humanity, the mother and her own child, dividing. Dividing them, dividing couples, dividing families, dividing nations, dividing the world. Furthermore, the Eucharist teaches us that the value of something or someone does not depend on size or appearance. And hence, the host, once consecrated, does not change appearance. How is it that we know that this is the body of Christ? Adoro te devote, latens deitas. And of course, later on in that hymn, seeing, touching, tasting are in thee deceived. What says, trust thee, hearing that shall be believed? What God's Son has told me, take for truth I do. Truth himself speaks truly, or there's nothing true. This is my body. So we believe what we hear because the one who's saying it is the one we trust. And we don't believe our other four senses. So it is with a child in the womb. I mean, you go back far enough, far enough, early enough, and that doesn't look like a human being. Seeing, touching, tasting are indeed deceived. Can a baby the size of a pencil point be a human being entitled to personhood and constitutional rights? Well, can a particle of the host the size of a pencil point be God? It's easier for us to believe the former than the latter, but we believe both. As Mother Teresa said, if I'm adoring the sacred host and I see there the Son of God with all my heart and soul, then I am training myself to see Him in the poor, in the disgusting, dirty, wretched, smelly, dying person in the streets of Calcutta, in the person in the hospital bed, unconscious, in the child in the womb. Training myself by that Eucharistic faith, we're training ourselves to see the image of God in every human life. So these are just a few of the Eucharistic dimensions of being pro-life. And the more profoundly we meditate on this, not only does it help us, it's going to help our preaching and teaching for our people as they worship the Eucharist, and we show them that pro-life, once again, is not something we're adding on top of uh, our, our faith, but something that's already there at the very deepest levels uh, impelling us 
uh, to get involved in this great effort. Well, it's time for our first break, so let's um, uh, do that for 15 minutes. Then I look forward to resuming. Thank you very much.